episode 14. Sim looked up. Here comes Parsons, he said. Something in the tone of his voice seemed to add, that bloody fool. Parsons, Winston's fellow tenant at Victory Mansions, was in fact threading his way across the room. A tubby, middle-sized man with fair hair and a frog-like face. At 35, he was already putting on rolls of fat at neck and waistline, but his movements were brisk and boyish. His whole appearance was that of a little boy grown large, so much so that although he was wearing the regulation overalls, it was almost impossible not to think of him as being dressed in the blue shorts, gray shirt, and red neckerchief of the spies. In visualizing him, one saw always a picture of dimpled knees and sleeves rolled back from pudgy forearms. Parsons did indeed invariably revert to shorts when a community hike or any other physical activity gave him an excuse for doing so. He greeted them both with a cheery hello, hello, and sat down at the table giving off an intense smell of sweat. Beads of moisture stood out all over his pink face. His powers of sweating were extraordinary. At the community center, you could always tell when he had been playing table tennis by the dampness of the bat handle. Sim had produced a strip of paper on which there was a long column of words and was studying it with an ink pencil between his fingers. Look at him working away in the lunch hour, said Parsons, nudging Winston. Keenness, eh? <laughs> What's that you've got there, old boy? Something a bit too brainy for me, I expect. Smith, old boy, I'll tell you why I'm chasing you. It's that sub you forgot to give me. Uh, which sub is that, said Winston, automatically feeling for money. About a quarter of one's salary had to be earmarked for voluntary subscriptions, which were so numerous that it was difficult to keep track of them. For heat week, you know, the house by house fund. I'm treasurer for our block. We're making an all out effort, going to put on a tremendous show. I tell you, it won't be my fault if old Victory Mansions doesn't have the biggest outfit of flags in the whole street. Two dollars, you promised me. Winston found and handed over two creased and filthy notes, which Parsons entered in a small notebook in the neat handwriting of the illiterate. By the way, old boy, he said, I hear that little beggar of mine let fly at you with his catapult yesterday. I gave him a good dressing down for it. In fact, I told him I'd take the catapult away if he does it again. I think he was a little upset at not going to the execution, said Winston. Oh, well, what I mean to say, it shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Mischievous little beggars they are, both of them. But talk about keenness. All they think about is the spies and the, the war, of course. Do you know what that little girl of mine did last Saturday when her troop went on a hike out Burke's Hampstead Way? She got two other girls to go with her, slipped off from the hike and spent the whole afternoon following a strange man. They kept on his tail for two hours, right through the woods, and then, when they got into Amersham, handed him over to the patrols. What did they do that for, said Winston, somewhat taken aback. Parsons went on triumphantly. <laughs> My kid made sure he was some kind of enemy agent. Might have been dropped by parachute, for instance. But here's the point, old boy. What do you think put her on to him in the first place? She spotted he was wearing a funny kind of shoes. Said she'd never seen anyone wearing shoes like that before. So the chances were he was a foreigner. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? What happened to the man? said Winston. Oh. That I couldn't say, of course, but I wouldn't be altogether surprised if... <clears throat> Parsons made the motion of aiming a rifle and clicked his tongue for the explosion. Good, said Sim abstractedly, without looking up from his strip of paper. 
Of course, we can't afford to take chances, agreed Winston dutifully. What I mean to say, there is a war on, said Parsons. As though in confirmation of this, a trumpet call floated from the telescreen just above their head. Da -da 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 -da. However, it was not the proclamation of a military victory this time, but merely an announcement from the Ministry of Plenty. Comrades, cried an eager youthful voice. Attention, comrades, we have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns now completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. All over Oceania this morning, there were irrepressible, spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners voicing their gratitude to Big Brother for the new happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. Here are some of the complete figures. Foodstuffs, the phrase, our new happy life, recurred several times. It had been a favorite of late with the Ministry of Plenty. Parsons, his attention caught by the trumpet call, sat listening with a sort of gaping solemnity, a sort of edified boredom. He could not follow the figures, but he was aware that they were in some way a cause for satisfaction. He had lugged out a huge and filthy pipe, which was already half full of charred tobacco. With the tobacco ration at 100 grams a week, it was seldom possible to fill a pipe to the top. Winston was smoking a victory cigarette, which he held carefully horizontal. The new ration did not start till tomorrow, and he had only four cigarettes left. For the moment, he had shut his ears to the remoter noises and was listening to the stuff that streamed out of the telescreen. It appeared that there had even been demonstrations to thank Big Brother for raising the chocolate ration to 20 grams a week. And only yesterday, he reflected, it had been announced that the ration was to be reduced to 20 grams a week. Was it possible that they could swallow that after only 24 hours? Yes, they swallowed it. Parsons swallowed it easily with the stupidity of an animal. The eyeless creature at the other table swallowed it fanatically, passionately, with a furious desire to track down, denounce, and vaporize anyone who should suggest that last week the ration had been 30 grams. Sim, too, in some more complex way, involving doublethink, Sim swallowed it. Was he then alone in the possession of a memory?